March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, and we have some questions about the third most commonly diagnosed cancer in the U.S. in both men and women. Who better to answer those questions for us than our expert medical oncologist, Dr. Saima Sharif. Thank you, Dr. Sharif, for answering our questions. Well, thanks for having me. Of course. Could you give us a little bit of your background and what you do here at the hospital? Um, so I work at the Holden Cancer Center. I joined University of Iowa in January of 2016 as a medical oncologist. Uh, I have my medical oncology training and also tra training in running clinical uh, cancer trials. So I see patients and I also am part of the leadership of, uh, of the clinical trials we have in uh, uh, gastrointestinal cancers uh, at the Holden Cancer Center. And my specific area of interest is colorectal cancer. Yeah. Great, thank you for that. Let's get started with our questions. Um, so the first one is, what are the risk factors for colorectal cancer and are the risk higher for men or women? We can uh, divide the risk factors of colon cancer into two groups, into two broad categories. One are modifiable risk factors. They are, those are the ones that patients actually, or the general public has control over, what they can do to decrease their risk or increase their risk. Uh, and then there are non-modifiable, which include age. You cannot do anything about age. So the risk is higher as soon as you hit 50, uh, which is why the screening recommendation for our patients is to get a first colonoscopy at the age of 50. Uh, then family history, you cannot change that. So if it's there, it, you really need to know what your family history is. Uh, then if someone has a history of inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, that increases their risk. These are the non-modifiable factors. Modifiable factors include uh, increasing uh, physical act activity. We know that increased physical activity decreases the risk of colon cancer. Uh, more uh, milk products, uh, more fruits and vegetables in the diet, um, and, and uh, exercise as I talked about. And then increased amount of alcohol intake, red meat, processed food. Uh, these will increase the risk uh, of a patient or in, in, the general, in the general population for colon cancer. And uh, the risk for men is higher than women for all these factors. Uh, in, uh, uh, in 2020 alone, it is projected that about 78,000 men uh, uh, will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer uh, uh, as opposed to about 70,000 women So, wow. uh, in, uh, in, in just in t uh, 2020. These will be the new cases that are projected. Oh, so that is quite a difference. There is, yeah. yes. So the second question is, um, what is a polyp and at what point is a polyp deemed concerning? So a polyp is a small growth that can develop. It's a collection of cells. Uh, it can develop within the colon or the rectum. Uh, two thirds of the polyps are not cancerous. So that's important to know, but having said that does not mean that you can just like say that you have a polyp and there is nothing. It needs sure. to be removed. It needs to be looked under the microscope mm -hmm. to see if you're in the one-third category where the polyp is concerning, it has any uh, abnormal looking features, uh, because those features can range from just abnormal cells to actually frank invasive cancer. Okay, so is a polyp something that you can feel or that you would know is there unless you were to get a screening? No, If the po usually polyps sm start small uh, and they have to be about an inch in size before the risk of them turning into cancerous polyps, uh, th uh, that risk uh, rises steeply. Okay. Uh, but they're still small enough because our bowel wall is very soft mm -hmm. and very flexible, like you can, like a tube sock. Okay. Um, so you mean, uh, uh, someone who has a polyp that's even a centimeter in size may not actually have any symptoms to know to get help. Mm. So really that's screening, we can't emphasize enough how important that is. Correct, correct. Great. Um, so what are the most common symptoms of colorectal cancer? Uh, so I, I, as I mentioned earlier that, you know, colon is like a tube sock. Mm -hmm. So it goes from the right side to the left side and then the rectum and then, you know, the stool comes out at the end. Depending on the location of where the cancer is, mm -hmm. that's what dictates what symptoms patients are going to have. Mm -hmm. Typically, right-sided cancers do not present with the majority of symptoms that you see on the left side. Uh, the patients with right-sided cancer will mostly present to their primary care that they're tired, they have anemia, and that's where it's, it's up to the primary care physician to figure out why does a healthy woman, you know, in their 40s or 50s have anemia 
uh, or a, a healthy man, why would they have iron deficiency anemia? Because you're with the with the cancer, you're continually uh, continuously losing blood, uh, and that causes the anemia. And it's, this usually happens slowly. Patients don't actually see the blood in their stool, mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the most alarming symptoms, which could uh, uh, signal that the patient has a right-sided cancer. Left-sided cancer symptoms are not as subtle. Patients will uh, complain of new onset constipation or diarrhea, which you know they can't just say it's because of what they ate because it's been persistent for like a couple of months or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Left-sided cancers actually will bleed more where you can actually see the blood. And again, if you suddenly are seeing blood and it's not going away in a, couple, in a week or so, it's usually we tell patients it's a week to two week test of, okay, if the symptom is not going away, it needs to be looked at. You know, there will be changes in the diameter of the stool. So patients come, uh, come to us and say, well, I noticed that, you know, it looked like uh, toothpaste. It was mm -hmm. that, the diameter was that thin. You don't have to wait for that change, that significant change. If you're noticing bloating, pain, bleeding, change in your bowel habits, which is very uncharacteristic and has nothing to do with change in your dietary habits, mm -hmm. that's what needs to be looked at and brought to the attention of the primary care physician. Great. That's very helpful for people to know. Thank you. Um, a colonoscopy is one way to be screened for this type of cancer. Uh, are there any other options for screening? There are. And uh, there are other approved options as well that, uh, you know, again, that will be interesting for patients to know when they are thinking about screening, uh, uh, to, if whether they will be covered by their insurance or not. Uh, there are stool testing, uh, uh, especially the, um, the fecal DNA testing that is done. That's it's supposed to be done once a year as opposed to a colonoscopy. When you do one colonoscopy and you don't find any polyp, then the recommendation is to come back in 10 years because we think that's how long it takes for a polyp to start and develop into cancer. So uh, having said that, what is important to know is, yes, colonoscopy prep is, is difficult, it's daunting, uh, but the, the stool testing only tests for cancer. It does not test for polyp. So that's mm -hmm. something that also you need to be aware as a patient as you're getting your screening done, that what the limitation of that test is, it's not gonna detect a polyp, it will only detect if there is cancer, and the sensitivity is approximately 92%, even with, oh, uh, with the best tests that are available, looking at stool DNA. Okay, and so those are the tests that you see commercials for that you can mail it in, correct? Correct. Is that those are the, the DNA testing ones? That is correct. Okay. So it's better than doing nothing. Sure. It okay. is absolutely better than doing nothing. I'm not discouraging from getting those tests, but mm -hmm. it's just that uh, patients need to know that when you do that test, it comes back it comes back negative. Does not mean they don't ha they may they may still have a polyp. That's good to know. Uh, since colorectal cancer is being found in younger people more often these days, do you ever recommend beginning to get screened before the age of fifty? Um, so the uh, United States Preventive Services Task Force uh, has the recommendation for for a screening colonoscopy at fifty. Because of this emerging data in younger patients with, uh, with an increased rise in colon cancer, uh, the American Cancer Society in 2018 changed their recommendation uh, to, uh, to decrease the uh, age of screening starting 45. Okay. I think that is reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, I really feel that the cases that we're seeing uh, w would be, it would be very helpful for those uh, to try to catch those cancers early. Sure. But we are also, interestingly, and unfortunately, seeing a rise in colon cancer in patients aged 20 to 29 and in the early 30s. Hmm. Now, this begs the question, should we start screening colonoscopies at the age of 20? And I hmm. think that, yes, there is an increase, but I don't recommend that we start screening at the age of 20. What we can do, and if, you know, if there is one message from our, our talk today, mm -hmm. uh, in our discussion today, is uh, education of the general public of the symptoms to watch out for. Sure. To go seek help. Yeah. Because, you know, if a 20-year-old has bleeding in the stool and it's been going on for months, they should not just think they are hemorrhoids. 20-year-olds don't get hemorrhoids. Sure. They haven't had constipation long enough for them mm -hmm. to develop hemorrhoids if they're having change in their bowel habits and they haven't changed their diet. So it's this general education that 
uh, of the public, which is very important to know what the symptoms are, what, are to wa what, what is it that we need to watch out for, and then to seek help. Sure, and to really know your body and to know your routine so that if something changes, you're aware of that. Correct. Okay. Correct. So what does treatment for colorectal cancer consist of? It really depends on the stage. So once you have a colonoscopy and your di you, a polyp is found cancerous, uh, or they actually find they find an actual cancer, then the, the next step is to do the staging. Staging consists of how deep uh, the invasion of the cancer is, if there are any lymph nodes involved. Uh, so majority of colon cancers, uh, about 80% of them are diagnosed stage one through three, meaning that they are cured by resection. But the higher the stage, so some stage twos and some, some stage three cancers will also need uh, chemotherapy after surgery to get those microscopic cells that might be left behind, those cancer cells, to decrease the risk of recurrence. Okay. Patients with stage four cancer uh, don't always need a surgical resection because that can delay a systemic chemotherapy, which adds value to life in, mm -hmm. in terms of quality and quantity of life. Um, so usually if it's for stage four cancer, surgery is only reserved if patient's primary tumor in the colon is causing them a lot of symptoms. Okay, great. So our last question is, what should, if I'm someone who's looking to get screening done or um, has already had screening done and uh, is looking for someone to treat my cancer, what should I be looking for in a cancer center? Uh, I think it is very important to at least get a one-time consultation in a comprehensive cancer cancer center because uh, patients do get better care when there is a multidisciplinary team who treats cancers rather than just a, an office in isolation, like a uh, because the patient will most likely go to a gastroenterologist to get diagnosed, uh, and then you know then it's it's not that it's a it's a different referral base. It's just that part of being a comprehensive cancer center uh, dictates that you are up with all the rec uh, recommendations and the guidelines for treatment. Um, and I know in Iowa, access to care because of distances uh, is, is, a pro is, is a huge problem. It's a burden on, on patients. Uh, but a one-time consultation to find out what's the latest in the treatment. Uh, and then, you know, patients can always go back to their local community oncologists who we at the Holden Cancer Center have a very good relationship with and we can communicate to them if there is a cutting edge test that can help detect their cancer recurrence before we can even find on scans, which may not be available in a smaller community center. So that's what I would recommend, at least a one-time consultation uh, at the time of diagnosis. And if anything changes during, like if they recur, uh, and at that point, come back for a one-time consultation to see if there are any clinical trials available. Sure. Uh, I, you know, the, the university is is there for for this this particular purpose to have the cutting edge research. The cutting edge research. Sure. So we really want, and in, in the comprehensive, in the Holden Comprehensive Cancer Center, we really want to be a part of their team, their treatment team. Correct. Great. Correct. Well, thank you again, Dr. Sharif, for answering our questions. And if you're interested in learning more about colorectal cancer or the doctors here that treat it, please visit cancer.uiowa.edu.